All right, uh, we're in our second part of the tribes of Israel, how they began. We're in the end of chapter 29 uh, in verse 31 as we kind of begin what uh, one writer called the birth wars as we now have uh, Jacob and his two wives remembering uh, their serving seven years so that he could marry his, uh, his uh, beloved uh, Rachel. Uh, and that was the dowry he was not able to paint, so he works for seven years for his father-in-law Laban, who uh, we've uh, had a couple of analogies, but basically he's kind of the top used car salesman in the Middle East, and uh, he's a schemer and a tricker. And uh, we're going to see a little bit more of that uh, at the conclusion of uh, this chapter. But you recall the situation last week where uh, Jacob uh, waits for that time, the, the uh, wedding night, his bride in her veil, which would have been typical, a complete veil that we would uh, liken to a burqa today, uh, that would have remained on her until the morning after, uh, from which time he realizes that uh, there's been a switch and he's married the older sister, Rachel, and not, uh, and not the younger. Of course, infuriated, uh, he goes to Laban how can you do this to me? And he immediately then went before the Lord and sought God for wisdom, how he should lead his life, what he should, actually he didn't do that. <laughs> he should have done that, but he didn't. And he just went uh, right ahead and then worked in the, uh, finished out the wedding week and then had another wedding to marry Rachel. So now we've got uh, the father of the tribes of Israel is a polygamist, didn't really plan it that way, but that's where uh, he arrives at. We kind of concluded all of that with the reiteration of uh, Genesis 2.24. Here's God's plan. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, singular, and they shall become one flesh. The church itself is referred to in the New Testament as the what? The bride, not the brides of Christ, the bride of Christ. Here's God's intention and plan for marriage. And now Jacob has deviated from it. Certainly he was tricked he was schemed into it. He didn't go into it planning to do this. Uh, but he has gone along with it now, uh, and he's going to reap the consequences from having married two sisters that basically hate each other's guts. I mean, you know, they weren't real fond of each other apparently before, uh, and this animosity and bitterness is going to continue to grow in the relationship. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. Again, keep in mind the fact that Rachel, who basically <clears throat> is referred to as incredibly beautiful, like Sarah, is the same term that's used, uh, and, uh, and Leah, who is less lovely, doesn't mean that she wasn't attractive, but she's less lovely than her sister, uh, and we're going to have one that is longing to have children and one longing to be loved. And, uh, and there's going to be some, uh, some frustration for, uh, for both of them. But uh, there's uh, the overriding theme, I mean, for us, just in the application, just to put it out there right away, is that when we as believers compromise our faith and our beliefs and just do what is acceptedly culturally, it might be legal, it might be accepted by everybody around us, it might be what everybody else is doing, there are, there, if it goes against God's word, there's consequences to it. But their sin would not keep God from being faithful to his promise. God says to Jacob, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to be with you the whole time. I'm going to bring you back again, and you're going to be prosperous. I'm going to bring you back into the land, Eratz er Israel, back to the land where you need to be because you're the third patriarch. You're going to receive all the covenant promises and it doesn't matter how much sin these guys commit and all the crazy things. They do some pretty crazy things in this chapter. God is still going to be faithful to his word. So let's take a look at that. We first note uh, Leah. She hopes she can be appreciated by winning and, sorry, I just have to say it, the birth wars. Verse uh, 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again of bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again of bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi, or sometimes we say Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. 
So the appreciation here, the need for it, is seen certainly in the contrast of these, uh, these two gals. Uh, when it says uh, uh, in our verse, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, actually King James uses the word hate it. Uh, again, it's just to bring about the, the strong contrast between the relationship uh, between these two, uh, these two gals. Uh, we also see that God is the one who closed the womb of, of Rachel. God is uh, in all of this. Does Rachel have children later? Sure. Is, it, is God going to bless her later? Yeah. Is she going to have like the guy, Joseph, that saves everybody? Yeah. Is God going to work all things together in her life? Yeah. Does she believe that right now? Absolutely not. All she does is get angry and bitter as opposed to trusting the Lord. She's growing further away from the Lord instead of closer to him in this great time of need. And uh, God is going to deliver. God is going to bring her what she wants. Uh, she just can't get there in terms of her faith. We've got two very desperate women, one desperate for love, the other one desperate for children. Oh, the joys of polygamy. Well, let's go on. Uh, the hope for appreciation is seen uh, in the names of the first three sons. So Leah gives birth to Reuben, which uh, Reuben means, look, a son, number one boy. She says, the Lord has looked on my affliction, therefore my husband would love me. No, he didn't actually. <laughs> but every time they saw that kid, it's like, look, a son, will you come in for dinner? Rachel, my son. I realize you don't have one, but that's my son. Look, a son. I mean, all of these names are meant to be a dig towards the other one. And that doesn't change until Joseph comes along. And finally, somebody says, it is all about the Lord and not about me. But until then, all these other 10 kids up in that is meant to be a dig at the other person. And, uh, and again, the phrase, my, son, uh, my husband will love me is kind of the key to the whole thing. That's what it's all about for Leah. She gives birth to Simeon. Simeon means the Lord has heard. Uh, and apparently uh, the Lord heard, but Jacob didn't. She says, because the Lord has heard me, I'm unloved. And so obviously she's crying out to the Lord. And when she's in this position of desperate and crying out to the Lord, that's a good place. That's a good place to be. Uh, and we'll see the same thing again, that God gives grace to the humble. We don't see it in Rachel's life until she's in that same condition. That's when she gives birth to, uh, to Joseph. Uh, she gives birth to, uh, to Levi, or Levi, which means attachment. And notice she's kind of dropped the bar. She's given up on love. She's just hoping three sons will have something. will have some kind of relationship. I've got three sons. Uh, huge deal, I mean, in that culture. Uh, of course. And uh, of course, for Rachel to not have children means that as a woman in that culture, she's worthless. And so she's dealing with uh, not only her own feelings and her own relationship with, uh, with Jacob, uh, the, uh, the jealousy in watching uh, Leah have children, have babies around, her inability, but they're right there with her every day. Every name is a reminder of her desperate condition. Uh, and, uh, and again, Leah's not doing so well either. She's given up on the fact that maybe her husband would love her someday. Man, if we could just have anything, just any kind of an attachment, I'll take it. And of course, then the third thing we'd say, the appreciation is now given up and given to the Lord as Leah gives birth to Judah, which means praise. Now I will praise the Lord. Here, Leah is no more plea for love, for an improved relationship. I'm just going to look to the Lord. Good going, Leah. You know, there's just, there's just a lot, even in a great, wonderful marriage relationship, there's still not going to be total fulfillment in this life where our deepest needs in terms of love and joy and everything else, because that can only be met in a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God himself. And uh, it's often interesting to kind of talk with couples that uh, are doing premarital counseling and talk to them about why they want to get married. And, uh, and I used to give them a little book to read just to try to point them out to them, the fact that uh, if you're getting married to fulfill some need that you have in your life, that's the wrong reason. Because every need you have in your life is, needs to be met in Jesus Christ. Then when you go into the marriage relationship, you're not going in for what you can get, but for what you can give. Marriage is what you can give to another person, not what you can get from them. Every need you have in your life is meant to be, well, like a Judah, praise to the Lord. 
four kids, the fourth one, I've given up on love. I may never have an attachment or any kind of relationship. She says, but you know what? I got a lot to be thankful for here. I can praise the Lord. So that need for appreciation is now uh, given to the Lord. And uh, little did she know, Leah, that all of the priests and all of the kings of Israel would come from her. Leah's blood would flow in the veins of Moses, Aaron, David, and in Jesus Christ. She is the one in the end that will be buried in the tomb with Jacob at Machpelah. Not any of these other gals. She is the one. Uh, she's going to have it all in a sense in the end. She had no concept. She thought she was blessed, but she had no concept how blessed she was. She couldn't look down through the years in history, of course. And, the, and of course, that's our problem as well. Uh, our eyes get on ourselves, our own problems off of the Lord, and we really lose sight of the whole plan of redemption, how God wants to use our lives. How's Rachel doing? Well, she's pretty devastated <laughs> at this point. Let's take a look at her. As we get to chapter 30, verse 1, we say that Rachel's anger, well, leads to four more children in the birth wars and a couple of more wives, unfortunately. Verse 1, now when Rachel saw that she, uh, she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I'll die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, here is my maid Bila, or Biaha. Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him uh, Bilha as her, maid, uh, as her maid as wife, and Jacob went into her, uh, and Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. And indeed, I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. And uh, Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes. Got a basketball team, but we got a troop on the way. Uh, so she called her name, uh, his name Gad. And Leah's mate Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she named, uh, called his name Asher. Let's go back to Rachel here. So her anger now is focused on her husband. It was Leah uh, all about her, the bitterness that was there. But we would say the, the root of her anger is envy, as uh, mentioned in our text here. She envies Rachel because of the son she's able to bear. Uh, she envies because of what, uh, uh, what it means to her and, uh, and the fact that she's not able to bear children. Uh, she probably envy, envies her for a lot of other reasons as well. And it leads to this bitterness. It leads to this anger. And it eventually is destroying her relationship with Jacob, who totally loved her uh, more, more than anything else. He's the guy that served 14 years for her, and it was like a day because of his love for her. No, no reason to question that love, but now that whole relationship is breaking down as well. We need to watch out for envy. Proverbs 23, verse 17, same word there. Do not let your heart envy sinners, be, uh, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. We can either envy others or we can have a fear of the Lord, a reverence for God, a relationship with him, for surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. What are we really living for? Uh, envy is destroying her life. And certainly the, we might say the opposite of being envious is being content. And, and you have to keep in mind, you know, with, with us and our American culture, every commercial you watch on TV is designed to make you envious, right? If, 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 if they can't show you some reason why you should buy this stuff, right, you're not going to buy it, you know. I mean, they've got, uh, uh, it's amazing the products we have. You can make your carpet, carpet smell like lemons. I, you know, I don't know that that is a tremendous need in places around the world. But, I mean, there's all, all kinds of stuff that uh, if you don't realize that you have a need for this, boy, there is something wrong with you. It's all designed, of course, to make you envious or, or desiring or something that you may or may not uh, uh, need at all. And we kind of have to battle against this in our own minds. 
Uh, Paul says to young Timothy, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Why? Because we brought nothing into the world. We're taking nothing out. Don't get so wrapped up in all these things. In Philippians, he kind of makes the classic, uh, uh, the argument there, Philippians 4.11. Paul says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. He goes, I wasn't always this way. But I've learned to be content, and it's something we need to learn as believers so that we don't become envious and then bitter and then resentful uh, and, then, and then angry. Uh, he goes on in verse 12. He says, I know how it is to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We love the Philippians 4.13. The context is don't be envious. Be contented wherever you are. Paul says, if I'm shipwrecked or in a dungeon or in a prison, if I'm starving and have nothing to eat, I'm actually okay with that because I've learned to just trust God. He's going to get me through this somehow. Hey, if I'm feasting and having a great time, that's awesome. I'm still going to learn to trust the Lord no matter, no matter what my circumstances we're going to see a tremendous change in the life of Rachel and nothing changed in her circumstances in reality. God's plan, he was going to give her children. She just wouldn't wait. She wouldn't trust. And we see a Leah going from being blessed of God and praising God to back to conniving. And uh, this is just a, a very mixed up uh, family. And, uh, and certainly, unfortunately, so often we can relate to their lives. Uh, we mentioned the fact that Rachel's anger is now destroying the relationship with Jacob. Jacob is angry, we see in verse 2, and Jacob's anger was aroused. He's saying, is, am I in the place of God? By the way, haven't you noticed? I've already fathered four, four sons. I don't really know that this is on me here, the fact that we're not able to have children. I don't know that he said that, but uh, certainly there's, uh, there's an implication there at least. We also noted that uh, Rachel's anger will lead to a third and a fourth wife. Again, she's going to do what is culturally the norm. Is it legal to have an abortion in this country? Yes. Is it immoral? Absolutely. There's lots of things that are legal that are immoral. There's lots of things that are culturally acceptable that are not things that we should be involved in and doing. And when we, again, begin to be absorbed by the culture rather than observing the culture so that we can understand, know where people are at, be able to relate to them. We need to be able to observe the culture. There was a British missionary that uh, arrived in the Hawaiian Islands a few hundred years ago, and he did nothing for the first year he was there other than walk the trails up and down the Kona Coast and just watch and observe and listen, and he didn't say a word to anybody until finally he knew that he was ready to begin to, to share the gospel in a, in a cultural context so that people could uh, understand it. Uh, but our concern is what Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of our minds. I don't know about yours, but uh, I grew up in a generation uh, that, that said we wanted to be open to all these new ideas. And I can tell you what you get after a while of that, you get a pretty trashy mind. And when I came to faith in Christ, I knew one thing for sure. I wanted to learn the Bible. I needed to have my mind washed with the word of, of God. And I still need it every, every day. The Phillips, uh, J.B. Phillips translation of that verse says, don't let the world compress or squeeze you into its mold. So there's a world system that's out there. We say it's run by the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist. John said is already in the world in his day. This idea that drives us away from the Lord. Everything's going against it. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed it's not always real popular to be a Christian these days? I think it's becoming more obvious to us uh, here in, uh, in, in the United States. That's probably a good thing. There'd be more of a contrast between our lives. Uh, but again, Rachel here does something that uh, will bring about a third and a fourth wife as well as some more children. She says, take Bilha, and I will bear her child on my knees. Literally, that's what they did. In the birthing process, she's right there. How close? Close enough that when the baby came out, she came out into her knees. She took the child. It became hers. Symbolically, you just have the surrogate mother. Well, I'm glad we've learned our lesson on that. And don't mess around with the idea of surrogate mothers anymore. Oh, actually, we still do that. That's kind of made a big comeback, this idea of 
surrogate mothers. These things that we look in the Old Testament and go, what were they thinking? And yet here we are. We've come full circle on some of these, uh, some of these things. Uh, again, Jacob, what's he doing in all of this? When the, the idea comes to him uh, to take Bilhah as a maidservant, man, he sought the Lord. <laughs> Two wives, this is bad enough. No, he's just like, whatever. You know, he's just being the stalwart of the godly man leading his family. No, he's just kind of going along with all of this. But uh, that's all right. Jacob is going to have a bright, a bright moment here later in this chapter. She names him Dan, which means judged or vindicated. And she, she gives it all to God. See how God's helped me out here? I want to tell you, God had nothing to do with this. You know, it's just amazing when, when uh, you know, she can compromise to this degree and then say, hey, God was in this, though. See, it's all working out. It's okay. It's amazing what we can rationalize and, and blame on God. It was immoral. It was wrong, even though it was the accepted uh, standard of the day. Uh, the second son, uh, Naphtali, means wrestling, with great wrestling. <laughs> I've wrestled with God in prayer over this. No, I've wrestled with my sister. So the birth wars continue. Then you've got Zilpah, who gives birth to Gad, which I made reference to of troop comes, and it really means there's, there's more boys coming after this. Rachel, who's ahead in the birth wars now? You want to take your maid? I'm giving my maid. And uh, we're producing more boys here. Zilpha also gives birth to Asher, uh, which, uh, which means happy or good fortune. And uh, Leah was very happy because she's ahead six to two at this point in the birth wars. And unless Rachel can hit a grand slam, she ain't never going to catch up in this, uh, in this war going on here. Leah hopes to be appreciated, but she kind of gives on that. She goes to praising the Lord, but she seems to fall back into this envy and this strife uh, in the family. Rachel's anger is what leads to four more kids and two more wives. And Rachel's hopes now in verse 14 to 24, <laughs> it gets worse. She's going to hope for an advantage by bargaining for a secret ingredient. Now Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest, verse 14, and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken my, away my husband? Uh, would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore he will lie with you tonight, Jacob, for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come uh, into me, for I have surely hired you for my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages, because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Ishakar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God is in... Uh, endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dina, or we sometimes we say Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Yosef or Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. So could the baby wars get worse? Yes, they do. As Reuben is in the field uh, and he finds the, uh, the mandrakes and brings them in. So we first say that Rachel's placing her hope in a bunch of mandrakes. And what that is, is uh, it's, uh, I've got a little picture for you, a little quote from uh, Gordon uh, uh, Wenham, uh, an Old Testament scholar that says the mandrake Mandragora autumnalis is a perennial Mediterranean plant that bears bluish flowers uh, in the winter and yellowish plum-sized fruit in the summer, like an apple, small apple. In ancient times, mandrakes were famed for arousing sexual desires and for helping women to conceive. No science, just folklore. Uh, mentioned again in Song of Solomon, uh, the mandrakes give off a fragrance. Uh, and Solomon says, and at our gates are pleasant fruits all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. So in the ancient world, believe these, quote, may apples, love apples, uh, could help uh, in conception. So when Reuben brings them in, <laughs> Rachel desperately, uh, she sees them, uh, and then, 
well, this is kind of a radical deal she makes. And evidently, she's calling the shots at this point, who Jacob's with. She cuts a deal to get the, uh, the mandrakes. One writer said, tellingly, it is Rachel who, again, suggests the ungodly expedient. And it is a further example in this family of trading in things that should be above trade and resorting in trouble only half-heartedly to God. Uh, one writer said, these family ethics sound like a dog kennel more than a family. Uh, it's, it's at a pretty, pretty much of a, of a low here. And, uh, uh, and it seems at this point, uh, again, that Rachel's in control with who Jacob sleeps with. Uh, this thing goes on. Rachel has, uh, uh, again, no advantage as Leah is the one that ends up giving birth to two more sons. Obviously, the mandrakes have nothing to do with it. Uh, and she gives birth to son number five, Ishakar, uh, where she says God, uh, again, uh, she names him Wages. Nice name, nice name. Hey, uh, my son, time for dinner. Get Wages and bring him in here. Uh, by the way, uh, hey, how come mom called me Wages? That's kind of a strange name. Uh, I'll explain that to you when you get a little older. It's probably not a good idea right now. I mean, these are pretty strange names. And they're all, again, meant to put a dig into the other, the other sister uh, back and forth. And as I said, that doesn't really change till we get to Joseph. She gives birth to number six, Zebulun. God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me, still holding on for hope uh, to have a relationship uh, with Jacob. And then uh, and Dina, or Dinah, is mentioned here. Now, the gals aren't mentioned. There are other daughters that are born later. She's brought out to prominence for two reasons. One is her name, Dina, is the feminine form of Dan. So, again, her name is meant to be another dig into her sister. Uh, and also because she becomes prominent in one of the chapters we'll hit in a few weeks. We say Rachel's only advantage is that God remembers her lowly estate. Rachel gives birth to Joseph. Notice her response. The Lord has taken away my reproach. The Lord shall add to me uh, another son. First name that isn't a dig at the other sister. Uh, uh, the Lord's taken away my reproach. But, but Joseph means to add to. She in faith believes God will add to and actually give her another son. And he does. Gives her uh, Benjamin or uh, Benjamin, uh, the son of my right hand. Very interesting that the first son uh, Reuben is my son, and the last one is the son of my right, right hand. And, uh, <laughs> you know, just in studying these names and as we get into what some of these, these young men are like when they grow up, uh, you just kind of have to wonder what people are thinking about during the Old Testament times. And the priest would come out of the temple where he's representing the people and he's got the clothing on of the high priest and he's got, you know, that breastplate on. And each jewel represented a different tribe with the name of each tribe on those jewels. Well, there's wages and there, you know, it's just like, man, what a way to be represented. And here he is, he's God's representative to God and then uh, on behalf of the people and to the people on behalf of God. What a constant reminder of a, a kind of the assortedness that uh, they all come out of. And what a reminder of, of God's grace. And certainly it's not a, it's not a bad thing when we get reminded of what God's delivered us from once in a while as well. And we have that fleeting memory of that life of long ago, uh, hopefully, of how we were and what God has done and how he's blessed. And uh, it's not because of us. It's all because of his grace. Well, Leah and Rachel uh, are having children only because uh, God has brought it to them. And I think uh, really at this point in Rachel's life, uh, she is in this humble position. She is pretty much given up. And we would say their life certainly could be, uh, a verse could be Romans 5.20, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So Rachel's reproach is taken away. Number 12 leads to Jacob saying, I think it's time to get out of Dodge. And he's kind of had enough of uh, Laban and so forth. So in verse 25, J Jacob will make an agreement with uh, Laban for his wages. And this is very interesting. This is kind of a turning point in the life of Jacob. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go uh, to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go. For you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, please stay. 
if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, name your wages, and I will give it. Now Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now, when shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall, give me, uh, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flocks today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep, all of the brown ones among the lambs, and all the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages come before you. Everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats, brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it's with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. So he removed that, the he is Laban. So Laban removed that day, the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, and everyone that had some white in it, all the brown ones from among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So again, why is uh, Jacob wanting to cut a deal with Laban? Uh, it's because he wants to leave. So he makes this agreement so he can go home. And we note first that uh, Laban wouldn't give him anything. See, normally in Jacob's position, because he's caring as the shepherd for the flocks, uh, he would get anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. And 10 and 20 percent of everything they produced in terms of milk and, uh, and wool and, uh, and so forth. But he's got nothing. He's got nothing from, uh, from Laban. And he's not expecting anything uh, at this point. Later in chapter 31, verse 42, uh, Jacob would actually scold Laban. He said, uh, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely uh, now you would have sent me away empty-handed. You wouldn't give me anything, even after they set this wages. He'll make a reference later to the fact that, oh, by the way, you changed my wages 10 times, even once we had them set here. But uh, Jacob employs this, no pleas here. This is... Uh, I'm going, I'm going now, send me away. All I want is my wife and my kids, just send me away. That's kind of the idea of what he's, uh, what he's saying. Jacob, uh, Laban responds, though, classic. Oh, if I found favor in your eyes, <laughs> he lays on to flattery. Uh, makes a very interesting statement in verse 27. Please stay with me if I found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed you for my sake. This is one occasion where the King James, New King James kind of misses it. New American Standard, NIV, doesn't say I've learned by experience. It says I've learned by divination. And that's what it is in the Hebrew. Very interesting. Jacob's saying, I've consulted the spirits. And by divination, I can tell that the only reason I have this multiplication and this prosperity is because of you being with me. Uh, so Laban, again, is not exactly the spiritual giant. We know that he's kind of a rip-off guy, not a generous guy. Uh, but here uh, we have something else about him that we did not know. Now, we're, uh, we're warned in uh, Deuteronomy 18. He's uh, there, Moses writing. Same author says, There shall be not found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices uh, witchcraft, or is a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritus, or one who, one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the, to the Lord. Again, our culture, many of these things are very acceptable. Hey, you can call the psychic hotline. You can watch the psychics on TV. As I said a few weeks ago, you've got guys on ESPN that talk about, uh, man, they, the guy who had such a great game, I think he was uh, channeling Joe Montana when he made that pass. This is a sports guy from ESPN. And everybody knows what channeling is, right? Did anyone know what channeling was 20 or 30 years ago? No. <laughs> no. It was, it was so buried into the occult, I think only Christians might, might have even known what the term even meant. It's out there. It's very acceptable today. Uh, and it's very scary. And we are told by God, don't be like Laban. It's an abomination to God. He's a guy that wants Jacob to stay longer because he can make more off of him. And we'd say, secondly, that Jacob makes an agreement with, uh, for the wages uh, in, uh, on the appearance 
it would seem like it's not a very good deal. What Jacob basically is saying to him is that, you know, I've taken care of your sheep. I've done a good job. I've never stolen. I've never lied. I've never cheated. It's kind of a different picture of Jacob, isn't it? And he's, is he deceiving Laban here? Not at all. What he says here is that you just give me the crummy ones and you can take everything else the, in, in real terms. He's saying, I'll take the ones that have got any stripes or spots on them. It's going to be just a few. It's going to be just a few. Most were solid color as you looked out over the, uh, the flocks. He goes, I'll just take a few. I'll take the few crummy ones. That's enough for me. Does this sound like Jacob? This sounds more like Abraham when he tells Lot, listen, they're disputing between our herdsmen, so you can go wherever you want. I'll take the leftovers. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. Whatever you want to do, Lot. Why? Abraham knew God was going to bless him. I think at this point, Jacob can see the ladder again. He realizes, you know what? Even after everything that's happened, everything we've done, God said to me and Bethel, he was going to go with me. He was going to be with me. He was going to prosper me. And he's going to bring me back. I think he's believing it and realizing that God is watching over him. And he couldn't have done anything remotely possible for what's happened. What's happened in terms of these herds, what's about ready to happen is a complete miracle. It's an anomaly. Notice also what Laban does. Now, what, what is Jacob supposed to do? Jacob is supposed to be able to go through the existing herds and pick out all of the sheep, lambs, and goats that have these spottings on them. What does Laban do? He preempts. Verse 35, that day he removed the male goats that were speckled and spotted and so forth. He gives them to his sons, not to Jacob, who he's supposed to go to. He gives them to his sons and has them go a three days journey away. So that when they go to look at the flocks, it's like Laban's like, okay, Jacob, just go pick out all the spotted lambs and so forth. Oh, gee, there doesn't seem to be any. Oh, well, so sorry about that. Well, maybe, you know, maybe some others will be born. There just doesn't seem to be any right now. I guess you get nothing. This is Laban. This is classic Laban. Uh, but uh, again, what happens is something very different. But at least this is a bright spot for Jacob. I believe he's back to trusting the Lord again. Let's go on in verse 37. Jacob believes, though, he's still Jacob, that he can arrange a scheme in order to increase his flocks. Verse 37. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of almond and chestnut trees, peeled white stripes uh, uh, in them and exposed the white which was in the rods, and the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, and the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs, and made the flocks face toward the streak, and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves, and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, Whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous, had large flocks, female and male servants and Maseratis or the camels and donkeys. So uh, I would say Jacob arranged the sticks in order to influence the birth rate awesome idea i think had nothing to do with it but uh, you know, may, i don't know you know these guys are out there they're shepherds his father was a shepherd his grandfather was a shepherd who knows where jacob comes up with this idea that i'll put these striped rods in front of them and then they'll have striped offspring oh that sounds very scientific to me but uh, uh anyway uh it's just, this is just Jacob. I don't know what to tell you. But it was probably based on some superstition, maybe some folklore or something. Uh, the other part of this is kind of interesting, that he will arrange and separate the stronger from the feebler or the more energetic. There's actually a little bit of science behind this. In the uh, Jewish Encyclopedia, the Hom Sarna, which I've quoted a few times in our study here, uh, says that... Um, uh, there was the argument that the more vigorous of the flock, in contrast with the feebler, were the single-colored hybrids, that hybrids are characterized by what is called heterosis or hybrid vigor. Therefore, by careful observation as to which animals were more energetic, the breeder can determine which single-colored animals carry recessive genes for spottedness. In other words, these, these uh, goats and lambs seem to be more energetic 
I'm going to separate them over here. These aren't very, <laughs> very energetic. I'm going to separate them over here because he wouldn't know what a recessive gene was, of course, but he believed there was something different about them and that in time they would have more of a tendency to produce because they had the recessive genes, animals that had the spots and the streaks and the so forth. Therefore, he could kind of he could kind of separate and make sure he could roll the dice in his favor genetically to get more animals that would be his versus Laban's, and they would be stronger uh, on top of that. So uh, whether he knew that or not, uh, there's at least a little science behind that idea. Uh, but the third thing we would say, the most important, is Jacob's arrangements <laughs> were not the cause of his prosperity. Uh, this is all God, and this is all God's, uh, God's doing. Like his uh, grandfather Abraham, I mean, he's able to, uh, you know, return. Remember Abraham when Abraham goes to Egypt because he was such a godly man? No, because he was bailing out on God and wasn't trusting God. And he goes down to Egypt and then he's got to, you know, well, he's got to lie about Sarah and almost gets her married off to Pharaoh. But then he finds out and then, you know, rather than killing them, well, they get blessed and they give them the camels and the loot and the gold and the silver and all the other stuff. And then, and then Abraham comes out of that time of radical sin, uh, re repenting to God, incredibly blessed and incredibly prosperous. And we talked about the fact that, man, talk about the grace of God. I'm not told you, if I was God, I'd just handle Abraham a little different than that. I can tell you that. Lying about your wife, he would have paid for that a little bit. But uh, anyway, he comes out. Well, it's the same kind of thing. It's not like Jacob is there in Padan Aram, and he's living this sterling life as a tremendous witness for the one true God. He's got four wives. He's got 11 kids. He's got all kinds of things wrong with his family and not always trusting the Lord, but God said, I'm going to prosper you. Guess what? He's going to be prosperous. It was, all, it was all God, and it was all God's grace. Unbelieving Laban even knew it. Jacob apparently knew it, and uh, eventually all history would know it. It was all God. Ken Hughes says this, the angel freighted ladder with God's agents, the angels, ascending and descending on Jacob had been fully operational throughout the scheming and manipulation, the surrogate competition, the love potions, the selling of intimacy, the celebrating and the gloating, the humiliations and the tears of the loveless and childless. Truly God made the wrath of man to praise him Clearly, God would have no trouble using Jacob's sons, whether they are from Leah or Rachel or Bilhah or Zilpah. God would use them all. They had become the 12 tribes of Israel and a testimony of his grace and his love. Again, these two gals seem to get it right when they're in their most humble estate. There was another young Jewish gal that came to that same conclusion uh, in the New Testament and she records a song in Luke 146 where she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded what the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's certainly one of the lessons that we need to take home with us. And even in that, it's an amazing thing to me, continues to be that, Despite our sin, despite our shortcomings, despite what we don't do or should be doing for the Lord, he doesn't give up. And he's going to be faithful to us and faithful to his word no, no matter what. That's why when we sing those songs about the name, the name is a strong tower. It's God. It's his character. It's who he is. It's this kind of stuff. That's what we're celebrating. That's what we're singing about. That's what we say. That's what we run to. We're not running to a guy with a big stick to whack us over the head. We're running to someone that will embrace us and show us grace time and time again. When we deserve it, no. When we absolutely are at our worst and don't deserve it. Do we have an enemy that says the opposite, that God could never love, God could never show grace, and God could never forgive? If you hear that voice, that's not the Lord. It doesn't suit, meet, or match his character or anything we learn about him in the word. Twelve tribes of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were awesome guys, weren't they? <laughs> They're becoming. 
they're becoming. You know, Abraham wasn't much when God started. By the time we get from Genesis 12 to 22, he takes his grown son, Isaac, up on an altar and believes that if I have to sacrifice him, God will raise him up from the dead because that's the promised guy. God's word is going to come true. Incredible faith. But it doesn't start that way. God begins. And as we come to him and spend time with him, what are the rules I need to keep to have that kind of relationship? There aren't any. It's spend time with the Lord. Grow in your relationship with him. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. And apart from me, nada, nothing. That's what it's all about. But we have every reason in the world to spend time with him, to worship him, and to come to him, don't we? Because he is so good. Thank you, Lord of heaven.